On today's show, they're in a high school league all their own. And no, not baseball or basketball. This one involves a rod and reel. Next, it's time for a walk in the park. Our state parks are true treasures in Minnesota, including this one, the lighthouse and all. Up, up, up and over, up and Later, meet a family of champions. What's their sport? Well, it involves water, a log, and lots of balance. Our Minnesota Bound Classic this week takes a look at that slice of time in the morning, the sunrise, and why it's so special if you see it. Those stories and more next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. Now a question for you. Name one of the fastest growing team sports in our Minnesota high schools, huh? Well, it involves not a bat and ball, but a fishing rod and a boat. Travis Frank has the story. Boat launch traffic jams build angler anticipation. On Minnesota's whitefish chain of lakes, hundreds of bass anglers have come for their shot at a championship title. Come take off, their anticipation rockets. Shane Raveling has won dozens of bass tournaments in his fishing career, but today his driver's seat takes a back seat. Do your thing, boys. His son Mason and teammate Ben Provost are after the top prize. Our goal is to get to Nationals. First place today will punch their ticket. Those nationals, there's $80,000 in scholarships up for grabs. To win, they must fish as a team. Just find the fish and catch them. Mason and Ben represent Prior Lake in Minnesota State High School Bass Fishing League. Another one of the big brown ones, boys. A booming organization that launched their first bass tournament in the summer of 2012. We had eight teams that participated in that event, and then since then it has grown. We had about 20 teams, and now this year we've grown to over 262 members, of which just under 200 of those members are fishing in our state championship this year. Clubs form when two anglers secure a sponsor. That adult sponsor can be a parent, it can be a school member, or it can be an adult BAS member to help them get started. And once they have the two members, they start their club. Minnesota is following a national trend, bringing fishing into public schools. The membership for Minnesota is $20 for them to join as a member, and out of that $20, we provide four tournaments. So basically $5 is what it costs them to fish per tournament. On the water, school is in session, taught by some of the best in the bass fishing business. You don't want to blow up on your spot if you can help it, and then start out in 20 and work your way into about 12, and work up on the on top of the pump. Mentors provide a boat and advice, then their hands are off. The kids love it, and they get a volunteer boater who is a solid bass fisherman. A lot of them are professionals. They get to go out in a 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar bass boat, sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 fish a day. Our youth at this age, they just absorb this knowledge. They're like sponges. The more you give it of something they like, the more passionate they get, the more time they want to spend on it. For Michaela Anderson, this derby brings her fishing career full circle. Reel down, reel down, reel down, and then point at it. So like right down at it, and then just pull straight back like with the rod. That's kind of how I got started learning, you know, coming from a family that doesn't do a lot of fishing, you know, kind of learning from mentors and other coaches that brought me fishing, you know, it's that important for me now to give back and do the same thing. You're doing good, you got it. I was really happy, you know, when I got the call from the White Bear Lake girls, they needed a boat captain, and so I was definitely happy that I could help them out and kind of just pass on some of my knowledge and then just kind of bring them out for a day on the lake. So you tell me where you guys want to go. With the storm on the horizon, 
anglers race the clock. Matt Stearns and Lead Salila thrive under this pressure. Oh yeah, it's, it's fun fishing competitively. This is so much fun and you know, you only get three, four years to do it. We found out we both like fishing and since then it's just taken off, fishing tournaments together and fishing almost every day after school. You gotta go load up. Back at the boat launch, another traffic jam forms. 4.96. Bass after bass, angler athletes celebrate their catch. In Minnesota's fastest growing fishing league, crowns a new state champ. The growth is there, but I also think it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's no reason we couldn't double or quadruple what we have. Take a kid fishing, that's the greatest thing. And we get them out there, and no pun intended, but we get them hooked, and they really enjoy it. Coming up, this state park is known for its iconic views and, well, can you guess where it is? Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers, Jesse Treble's Safe Basements of Minnesota, Evan Root, the official outboard motor of Minnesota Bound, and by Connecticut. Is the season right for another walk in the park? What can I say but to enjoy our Minnesota state parks, what treasures they are. I think it's one of the best parks in Minnesota. It's uh, one of my favorites to come to. My name is Abe Hartzell. I'm the seasonal naturalist at Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. We are about an hour's drive north of Duluth along the north shore of Lake Superior. You get a little less crowds when you come here. You get a little bit more immersed in nature. We are sitting right here on the shores of Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. Well, the lighthouse is beautiful. So the lighthouse itself, it's over 100 years old. I know I went for years just going up to the, uh, where the lighthouse is. Obviously the lighthouse is an important piece to it, but a lot of people don't realize that there's more. A lot of people actually put in kayaks in this area, so you can actually kayak right underneath the lighthouse. This little bay right here is actually known as uh, Little Two Harbors. Over in this direction, we can see some of the remains of the old fishing village that used to be in this area. This is actually some of the old foundations that we see from some of the houses that used to be here. It has a lot of incredible history. The park is incredibly pretty and amazingly well kept. We have logging industry here too, so the logging companies were in this area actually harvesting the timbers in this area. These pilings that we see here are actually the remains from the logging companies that were here back in the early 1900s. If you kind of look for it, there's all these little pieces of history. They're kind of still reminders of what happened in this area. So if you hike up the river about three or four miles, you actually come across this giant rock and it's just got, looks like it's got a just big split through it. That's where the name, the Split Rock River, actually comes from, is that big historic rock. There's Corundum Point, which is a little bit farther down the shoreline here, which actually is the site of an old historic mining operation that was here. And that's a pretty interesting story is uh, they thought it was corundum and they misidentified the rock. And so what they actually did is they manufactured kind of faulty sandpaper for a few years until they figured out it was the wrong type of rock. This is the rock that they thought they came for, which they thought was corundum, which turns out it's actually a northrosite. 
And this rock is actually pretty interesting because we find it here at Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. Another really good spot where we find this is actually on the moon. So this is kind of a, a moon rock that we have here at Split Rock too. This is one of the hidden gems I think we have on the North Shore here. It's just, it's a great lookout. If you hike to the top of Day Hill, you can actually overlook kind of the Split Rock Valley and you get a really awesome sunset. A good way to end your day here would probably be do an evening hike when it gets a little bit cooler and the sun's just starting to set. And then maybe just kind of seeing if you especially have clouds in the sky, just kind of watching that different color over the lake. It's just magical when you look at it. There you go, that's good. Coming up, it's a serious family business that involves lots of serious balance. Closed captioning is brought to you by Border View Lodge. Sometimes life is better when you just roll with it. Roll a log, that is. Nice. Pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. Pass pick your feet up, pick your feet up. There you go, nice. Yep, that's it. Abby Heschler and her sister Lizzie were taught this life lesson at a very young age. Yep, faster, that's it, there you go. Little steps, little steps, little steps. <laughs> I think I probably started log rolling as soon as I could walk and swim at the same time. Push the little amp. Well, I grew up in a family of world champion log rollers. My mom is a seven-time world log rolling champion. She not only passed on her love of log rolling, but also her love of teaching log rolling to me and sharing it with others. Woo! And I won my first world championships as, as a five-year-old in six and under. <laughs> so what do two log rolling sisters do with their unusual up, 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 up. skills? Up and over, up and over. Even as a young kid in high school, and. I, I loved teaching my friends. I started a program through the Park and Rec Board. Up, up, up and over, up and over. Nice recovery. Good job. Log rolling was a sport people really loved, but they didn't have access to it because of the equipment. Today, log rolling is considered a sport, but there was a time when log rolling was a workplace skill. It's actually originated from men driving logs to sawmill towns, and they, when they'd step on the floating logs, they spawn and they had to learn how to stay out of the ice cold water. It was survival for them. Nothing has really changed. It's really a very pure, authentic sport. People have gotten better at it and now the equipment, which is gonna be able to spread this sport all over the world. Not much has changed. Nice. However, the equipment is a little heavy. A 500 pound cedar log. So the ladies invented their own training tool. So the key log is a 65 pound uh, synthetic log rolling log that you fill with water. And then you just slide on these trainers. So now with the trainers, they can actually stay on long enough to learn, get kind of the balance, get their muscle memory down, start to build their footwork. Nice. Really create a progression to learning and they're learning so much faster. Okay, let's see how fast I can learn, or how fast I don't learn. That as a beginner, your goal isn't to make the log spin, it's to stay on top <laughs> by taking small little fast steps and stay right up on top, and almost keep the log from spinning. You're trying to keep it under your control. <laughs> Look, I think I've got it down. <laughs> there you go, that's fine. Just get, yeah, just get used to that. Look at the log's moving so fast, you can't even see it moving. <laughs> fast feet are happy feet, hence the sport of log rolling keeps growing. Nice, there you go, that's good. Log rolling feels kind of risky at first and feels like a challenge, but it's still safe and you're doing it with a group of people and you're just right here on the beach. So it's super easy, you can just step right into the water and hop on the log. Nice, dig your heel in, Abby, dig your heel in. And when you're having fun, you let the good times roll. So I think everyone loves this challenge and it's, it's really fun to see that so many different types of people are learning how to log roll. 
Get control of the lock. Get control. Steady your core, Allison. There you go. Yep. All right. Minneapolis Log Rolling Championship. Here I come. Whoa. Might be in 2025, but I'll get there. The early bird gets the worm, in this case, the sunrise. Don't miss this Minnesota Bound Classic. That's up next. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Ellsworth Cooperative Creamery. Minnesota Rebath. And by Totem Resorts. Time now for a Minnesota Bond Classic. This one is about something so obvious, such as the start of a new day, a sunrise, something magic about it, wouldn't you say? This is nature's version of the greatest show on earth, a sunrise. Everybody in the world gets one every day and almost always the sunrise makes us think. Duluth writer Sam Cook. It's full of possibility and potential and you're ready for whatever the day is gonna throw at you. Famed hunter Ted Nugent. It's all about the spirit. Somebody's gotta tell these kids that getting up this early and dragging your lazy ass out of bed really has its rewards. Author Pat McManus wrote that the best thing about sunrises is that they are free, free and powerful. The sun coming up every day is a story, author Terry Pratchett wrote. Everything's got a story in it. No two stories are alike, of course, and no two sunrises ever seem to be identical. An African dawn is certainly different, Nothing like greeting the day with a giraffe. When day breaks over a Saskatchewan prairie in autumn, a symphony of birds makes for a living sky. Yet, all sunrises, no matter where, seem to shed light about life itself. For author Jim Rowan, a sunrise was a lesson in time. Time is more valuable than money, he said. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. When you're up before sunrise and you're waiting for the sun to rise on a deer stand or forever, it's, you realize what a long process it is. It reminds you of how slowly nature does most of what it does. Most of us watch the break of dawn and bask in its silence. Moving moments in our lives find us all without words, Marcel Marceau once said. Marcel was a mime. To Mother Teresa, a sunrise was a message from God. God is a friend of silence, she said. See how in nature, trees, flowers, grass grow in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. Oh, not everybody loves sunrises. Some folks have no interest. Author Clifton Webb wrote that he hated dawns. Why? Well, he said the grass always looks like it's been left out all night. It's been said you can't sneak a sunrise past a rooster, so live the moment. When tomorrow comes, they say, this day will be gone forever, and in its place will be something you've left behind. Let it be something good. Let us begin with, good morning. Ah, yes, sunrises. And just to think, sleepyheads never get to see one. That about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors, show him a sunrise. I'm Ron Sharon, of course, always the star of the show. Very antsy again is Raven, right? Oh, my God. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. 
Call 1-800-899-7433. To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook 